and skill suggesting the ability to categorize and recategorize. Uh, it's tied to the acquisition of literacy. But does it mean that knowing literacy itself is what enables you to do this? Or that, you know, you went to school uh, where you learned to be literate and lots of other things happened when you went to school. And presumably, also, if you went to school, you were of a different background than people who didn't want to go to school. There's a cultural background there. But how do you know what, what's responsible for this? Maybe literacy just happens to be this thing that people learn something entirely different. Also know that it enables them to be better at these categorization, uh, categorization tasks. What you'd like to have is a situation where you could do an experiment where people in a community, not just individuals, people in a community uh, grew up, um, uh, some of them non-literate, some of them literate but without schooling, some of them literate with schooling, and so on and so forth, and, and see if you can do that. It's hard to find that kind of situation, certainly in, in modern America. There are places in the world, though, where there's, it's never perfect, but there are places in the world where there are situations very like that. Um, one of them is in um, uh, Western Liberia, in, uh, in, um, in uh, West Africa, among the Vai people, uh, who were studied by um, uh, Michael Cole and uh, Sylvia Scribner uh, down at U, um, <coughs> UCSD, uh, psychologist. Um, now, Vai has, people in, in this culture have several way, writing systems that they use. One is that this was uh, a former, you know, it's an American influenced part of the world in, in, in Liberia. And English is widely used, um, I think, very high English, uh, almost everybody speaks speak English, and very high levels of English literacy, and people learn literacy in school, and English literacy in school, and so on and so forth. Um, there's also this syllabary, um, the syllabic system, uh, that was invented in the 19th century, much as Sequoia invented a syllabic system for, uh, for charity, um, that's used, taught by in a kind of apprentice-like way by, uh, by relatives or, uh, or, 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 or parents to, to, to kids not taught in schools. And it's used for, uh, for writing letters and for keeping commercial records and so on and so forth. And finally, because this is a Muslim part of the world, um, everybody uh, who is Muslim uh, learns Arabic. But the way in which they learn Arabic is just to read it and recite the, re recite the verses of the Quran. There's no instruction in Arabic. There's no, they don't have to write Arabic. Right? It's just a question of, of, of being able to read the Quran and the Arabic. The so you have three situations here. Um, some people are literate, and, and then people, obviously, most, many people are more than one of these. Some people use only one system. Most, most use two or three uh, of the different systems. Um, uh, but, but there are people who are literate and by and not in English and so on and so forth. Um, so it's a nice experimental setting. Here. Now you can say, well, there's some people who are literate and learn to school. And some people who are literate and learn to write and read, 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 that is, they this syllabic system, uh, the Vi system, um, but only learned it as a writing system from their parents or uncles or whatever. Um, do virtually no better on these cognitive tasks than people who are non literate. Mere literacy in Vi, just knowing the system of writing, doesn't give you a leg up on those tasks of, of recategorization. It does give you a leg up on certain tasks that involve language itself. They're kind of rebus puzzles like that. I saw your duck deer, I saw your duck deer. Kind of, if you give them sentences like that, the, the ones who learn Vi are quicker at getting those. Together. But, but most of these basic non linguistic categorization is going to be better. Um, uh, <coughs> English literate Vi, who, um, who went to school, do do better. So, a conclusion one could draw, and obviously there's lots of confounds, lots of complications, these are all you know, real cultures in real setting, but a conclusion one could draw is that it's not literacy itself, it's literacy in the context of schooling, or it's just schooling, or the kind of schooling that, that makes you literate, uh, because the Arab-speaking the Arab, uh, Arab kids don't do that either, the kind of schooling that makes you literate, that makes you better at these cognitive tasks. And what that reminds one of is that a technology like literacy uh, lives in the midst of, uh, of an extended social custard. Uh, we talk about technologies, uh, the word technology itself is an interesting word, it, uh, it's really a 20th century word, um, and it's a word that does a certain kind of secret work, because although we use it just to refer to a, an invention or a machine, those inventions always presume this very complicated social background uh, in which these, these, these things are operating. Um, you talk about the computer, but there's a whole social, economic, political structure behind the technology of what we think of as information technology. And similarly with writing. Um, <coughs> and in particular, learning to be literate um, is what we think of learning literate, we speak of learning one's ABCs. Right? It's, it's, you know, we saw when did you become literate? Well, in fourth grade or whatever it was, probably in your case, second grade, because you're all exceptional kids. Um, uh, somebody gave you an ah, bah, cat, you know, could, so on and so forth. How are you learned it? And that's when you, you learn to be literate. Um, and this is a wide, uh, widely held assumption. It's the one that underlay the UNESCO programs that say we have to make everybody literate and, 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 um, because it, it creates these conditions that are favorable to modernity and modernizing them. Um, it's more complicated than that. That's basically a sentence you could put at the end of every class we give here. It's more complicated. What have you learned? It's more complicated than that. Um, in, the, um, in the 1960s, um, when uh, the Johnson administration launched uh, the very ambitious war on poverty uh, that all you've heard of, uh, you know about it in some sense, um, one crucial element of it was to do something, in particular for inner city children who were falling behind, who started out behind and went, you know, what things went, went worse from, then, um, from, from then on. Um, and so they introduced this program called Operation Head Start. Um, now, Head Start was a program in which you were going to take these kids, these inner city kids, you were going to put them in uh, preschools in which they would learn reading and writing and, and uh, basic literacy skills and give them a head start so that when they came into kindergarten along with the other kids, they would have this leg up um, and the, um, the educational deficiencies that, that uh, th 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 those kids had would be, would be remedied uh, by this program. Um, like a lot of the elements in the war on poverty, this one seemed initially not to work very well. Uh, the cynical line on the war uh, on poverty uh, uh, by administration opponents in particular was uh, uh, we declared a war on poverty and poverty won. Um, the kids who went to this Head Start program didn't seem to do much better on any of the standard tests two or three or four years later than the kids who had been in the program. Um, so the idea was that it was a failure. Now it turns out that 20 years later they went back and looked at those kids who were in the Head Start program. They had, in fact, there were measurable differences uh, that showed up much later down the line. Um, but at the time it looked like Head Start was a failure. And in fact, the effort to make these kids, give these kids a leg up in literacy um, just wasn't going to work, or if it worked, was not going to give them the cognitive skills they, they needed. Um, there were two very important reactions to this apparent finding. I said apparent, and it turns out it wasn't quite true. Um, to this apparent finding. One of them was the work of Arthur Jensen. Anybody here heard of the name Arthur Jensen? Know who he was? Um, he was a Harvard educational psychologist, that, that um, who, uh, who wrote a book um, in which he argued, along later in the man, Charles Murray, who I see has a new book out, um, that, look, the problem here, let's be frank uh, about this. These kids, um, uh, there, there are biological roots of intelligence, of IQ. Um, and uh, black kids, uh, or blacks in general, just don't biologically have the same intelligence, uh, endowment, intellectual endowment that whites do. Although, you know, this is not to say anything bad about blacks, right? but just look at the statistics and look at the learning and correct for all the, 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 the twin studies and people raised apart and class and
uh, uh, finding. Uh, and it was responded to very vehemently and, 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 and very powerfully by, um, uh, by a number of people. Stephen Jay Gould, whom some of you know, wrote a very uh, powerful uh, um, response to it. Um, um, Milt came in at, um, at Princeton, a psychologist, important psychologist. There was a lot of literature on this. Uh, to Murray's book as well, Charles Murray's book as well. Who, um, <coughs> um, there was another response um, that was, in the end, you know, less controversial and certainly didn't create the kind of uh, uh, controversy and fracas that, uh, that um, uh, Jensen's work did, but that in the end was equally important. Um, there were a couple of educators, yet a good man at the University of Arizona, Shirley Bryce Heath, who was at the time a colleague of mine at Stanford, is now at, I think, Boston University in the UK now. Um, um, and they said, hang on a second. Maybe the problem is that we started with these kids too late. Maybe three, three and a half, four was too late. Well, three and a half, four, I mean, it's a year before anybody else starts kidding about it. Maybe it's too late. Let's look and see what happens in the homes of literate children, in the homes in which literacy is used, in which kids acquire literacy, uh, and see what happens before the ABCs, before the actual mastery of, uh, of, of, of the ABCs, and what, what, what goes on there. Um, <coughs> so uh, they looked at these, there's a lot going on. Just the fact, and I assume almost virtually all of you grew up in homes in which your parents were literate. Um, well, if that's the case, um, you know, your kids were, your parents were reading you stories when you were very little. You had a book, right? There'd be a row of books in your, in your room, uh, and each one looked different, and you knew that. Um, you could go and get this blue book or the red book or the book with the picture of the, the, the rabbit and you get the velveteen rabbit. You went to the book with the picture of the little boy and the child in bed and you got Good Night Moon and so on. But each of these things, these objects, evoked a different story, uh, a different story from, from, from your mother or from your dad. Um, um, <coughs> and moreover, that story was the same. Night after night after night after night. Um, uh, you, um, in the course of, um, it's interesting to look at how kids, um, uh, have people have, how many people have small siblings or whatever were, you know, young kids or some of you, uh, three, four, five in there, still learning to, before, yeah, I quite learned to read. How many kids have, are in the process of learning to read, have siblings were, okay, one, two, three. Yeah. Um, when you learn to read, here's what happened. First, you're, you're, you would go and say, I want to hear the Velveteen Rabbit, I want to hear the Good Night you get the book, and you know, Dad would take it, he'd start to read the book, and so on. But at a certain point, um, you, would, um, you would read yourself. Right? Now, what reading yourself be? Well, you would take the pictures, and you would turn the book, and you would tell the story in the book. Completely different words and wrong words, and so on and so forth. But um, you would nonetheless know that each of these pages evoked a certain part of the narrative, and, and um, uh, you would tell the story that way. Um, at a later point, uh, you would start telling that story in the same way, but you would do in what the Shirley called talking like a book. So the rabbit went and he went to the store and he saw his friend, that kind of sing song that parents read the stories. And you would say your own story in that, in that sing song, showing knowledge that there was something about this language uh, that was different. Um, uh, at, a certain port, at a certain point, um, you might actually start recognizing words. And when that page was turned, you'd say rabbit, just because the word was on that page. And finally, um, uh, you're, uh, having done this for a year or whatever, uh, your dad or your mom would give you the book and say, you say I can't read. And that's a big step because the kid was pretending to read up to that at a certain point and realized there was something else going on that the kid hadn't learned. All of this happens well before this kid has learned ABC, cook, cat, you know, that, that stuff. That's, that's quite late. Um, literate parents talk to children very differently. What's that called? What's that called? What's that called? Uh, that's uh, an activity that's much more common in literate homes than in non-literate homes. Um, literate families at table stay on topic longer and produce longer utterances than non-literate families. In fact, the best predictor of achieving literacy skills among non-literate families, organized religion. Organized, why is that? Because you go to church and the pastor talks for a long time on a single topic and so on and so forth. And you see that this is, uh, that this is possible. Um, I recall a story um, many, many years ago. I went, um, I went to lunch um, uh, with, uh, with two friends. And one of them, um, one of them had, they hadn't seen each other in a long time. These two and one of them had her little daughter, Ariel. Ariel must have been three. She's now teaching the University of Pennsylvania. This is how long ago that was. Um, and uh, she had Ariel with her, and I was going to distract Ariel. was kind of being a three-year-old, and these two women were going to talk, so I was distracting Ariel. I said, all right, let's, let's write a letter to your mom. Oh, let's write letters. Okay, well, first of all, we need a paper. She got a napkin. Okay, napkin. We have a pen. She brought a crayon. And we wrote, say, now, what do you want to say to your mom? And she said, I want to say, Mom, I love you. So I wrote, I love you. I said, okay, we'll fold it. Right? Now, we have an envelope, and we found something. I remember we put it in the envelope. Oh, we need a stamp. Uh, we need a stamp. We took a sugar packet and licked it and stuck it on the thing. Now, who's going to deliver it uh, to your mom? She said, I'll deliver it. Okay, so take your mom. Her mother, uh, Vicky, says, oh, what's this a letter for me? And she pulls it out, opens it. I love you, Ariel. Oh, and she gives her daughter a big kiss. Now that was the moment that Ariel learned what literacy was about. She understood this miraculous thing where you could make these marks over here that would invoke a kiss five minutes later from her mother who had been in the present when they That's that's a lesson of literacy. And this all takes place as part of the cultural background. Um, where sure, the, you know, the ABCs are kind of crucial. At some point, you have to come to that and learn to do this, and, and, and that's important. But um, this particular technology um, takes place within a very complex social social background that really gives its meaning. And that's the lesson we're going to take um, uh, here and and, um, and for um, uh, you know, subsequent discussions. Let me briefly um, mention one other. Uh, Feature, that's interesting. Um, things are different now. I mean, we have lots of other technologies. When we're talking about societies that are just becoming literate. They're not becoming literate the way the Greeks or the Egyptians did or whatever. They got all this other stuff there. Um, consider the case of Somalia. Um, um, <coughs> uh, Somalia is um, a, a Muslim country. Um, most people in Somalia were literate in, are, 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 were in our literate in Arabic. Some, like the Vikings, can only just read and pronounce it. Others use you know, Arabic. The Mullahs certainly use Arabic. Um, um, uh, but the language had no writing system until the 1970s. In fact, an Italian team headed by a linguist named Francesco Antonucci and uh, I don't know, yeah, two another time, went to Somalia and produced this, this writing system. Well, it was actually kind of complicated because um, uh, the um, uh, they, they wanted to use the, the, the Arabic alphabet because it was a country. But, you know, Arabic is a language of an alphabet without vowels, and this is a language with a lot of vowels. I mean, it would be really hard to do it with that. So they were going to use the, the Roman alphabet, which unfortunately in, in, in Somali, the word for Roman is Ladin, uh, which is the Latin, you know, Latin, but also means without God. Right? So the mullahs were unhappy about this. But at a certain point, actually, they, they clapped the mullahs in jail. They actually dropped this alphabet on people uh, from the sky, uh, from helicopters onto the oasis with these groups. And, uh, and they, they are now uh, a literary country. There are newspapers and textbooks and so on and so forth. And that's it. You go there and say, oh, Somali's literary. The work of oral culture in Somalia, the important political and social work, was done by this form like Homer's verses, like the ones that Milton Perry study, called the Gabai. It's this very complicated metrical uh, form with, uh, with 21 syllables and so on and so forth. Each chieftain has his bard, and the bard, when he wants to make known his position on some political, and obviously
two-headed cassette decks, you know, two, 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 the ones where you can copy, the ones where you can duplicate things. And people are, so I'll have my bard make a goodbye on my behalf, and then you're on the other side, you'll have your bard make a, a goodbye, and take my goodbye, use the same alliterative pattern to respond. And you'll get three and four of these deep in these, 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 uh, these cassettes, and literate people have their homes, long lines of these cassettes. Um, the non-literate form, the goodbye, didn't have to be written. Uh, the way Homer had to be written down. It's just preserved in this other technology, in a way in which the, the technology enables people to leapfrog certain the functions of literacy. The cassette deck was crucially important um, in, with Khomeini and the Iranian Revolution uh, that opposed the Shah. Uh, and even now, cassettes in, in the Arab world are widely used. To, 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 the uh, Al Qaeda was using cassettes in this way to, to, to distribute these, these oral uh, messages. Um, so this keeps up with the technology in a certain sense. Um, if you go now on uh, on YouTube, oh, come on, work in rehearsal. You hear the goodbyes by the bards. Mm-hmm. You listen, you can almost hear the 21 syllables. It's like two lines of Ionic pen. And he's saying something about the Muslims. I don't know what it is. But um, this form survives and continues to flourish, having leapfrog literacy. The functions of literacy turn out to be, um, in, in, in some sense, less important now in many cultures than they were uh, in the time of Greece. Uh, next time, very quickly. Um, um, do you want to say anything about the Greek Okay, two, two people. So we're looking now at this, this uh, contemporary accounts of uh, Plato talking about writing and invention of writing. The second one, the previous thing is the text that you have is a parallel text. That is, will be Latin on the left hand side and English on the right hand side. You're not obliged to read the Latin. Just read it. So it looks like a lot of something like this. And we'll talk about it on this. <laughs> so, I have a few questions. Okay, I'm just going to so you mentioned Good Night Moon? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Rose is a joke for Christmas. Mm-hmm. They now have Good Night iPad. Good Night iPad? Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's depressing. That's depressing. That's depressing. That's depressing. Yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what, like, you know, from just like a broad standpoint, how much do you really need to comprehend to be considered a literate? I mean, like, if you could say, you know, you can sort of, you know, sort of like French English, you know, you can read and you can pronounce the words, but if you don't really understand what you're saying, then, you know, does that count in some sense? Or is well, it... we'll actually talk about that. It's very complicated. I mean, yeah, we'll talk about that. Actually, that's, that's a good question. We'll spend 15 minutes talking about that. Um, uh, you know, for historians, um, uh, can you sign your name? Right, it's important. Why is that? Because it's the only thing I think so. Um, uh, you know, how many people could write their names? Um, uh, and the degrees of literacy. I mean, even now, I mean, how literate am I? You know, I still can't figure out why the hell, you know, uh, Gmail is sending all my incoming mail to, to, to now. Well, but, but, but literacy isn't this thing as abstract. I mean, literacy was within the topic of using email, using writing checks, writing tax things, using that. So literacy, in that sense, is embodied in this whole set of social practices. If I, if I can't use Google Maps to find directions from here to my house, am I literate? But yeah, but this particular application of literacy, I don't have. So, so that's, that's what makes it yeah, so this is probably more of like a cultural sound thing, but you know, especially with something like English, where there is, you know, really no exact pronunciation. I mean, why is it then that, you know, people suddenly move to Boston, they don't understand how the letter R works, you know? I'm not sure what you mean. Like, how, you know, how you get, in a way, you know, from all the different pronunciations, you have the same language when people are, for the most part, coming from the same background, or, you know. You mean, why do people, when they go to Boston Choir, or Boston Yeah, Edison, yeah or, 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 or just, they're being friendly. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, like, how does, is that something that just kind of randomly develops over time, or? I mean, the dropping of the R, I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, well just, why just in general, you know, or just. Well, I mean, I mean in some cases, the Boston, the difference between Boston and Delaware, say, has to do with part of the original founders of settlement. Boston settlers came from Somerset, South of England, people in the, uh, in the particular, you know, Western uh, Virginia and so that came from uh, Wisconsin, Irish, and so on. They, 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 some of these actually, and then they develop. I mean, you know, vowels, vowels, these are these complex systems, like the weather, and the vowels, the vowels, and American Northeastern English are doing this big dance now. So yeah. you get, you know, you get to Detroit, you get to Detroit, and, you know, Gak, you know, Gad, oh Gad, I got Gak. You know, I mean, these vows have been, you know, and this has been going on for the last seventy. We've documented for the last seventy-five years. So, so they keep changing uh, in yeah. response to these very complicated. So, I mean, is, it, is it something you know specific, or does it just kind of just happen, just from that it starts out somewhere? Well, there's a lot of literature on that. Um, uh, it, they, they have a culture. Oh, darn. Um, 